Yeah, JR and I would work, uh, was, was working at AT&T a regular day. Then we'd probably work uh, till like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and get up and work the next morning. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Carl Moser and J.R. Hall were founders of Eastern House Software, the company that created several products for Atari 8-bit users, including Monkey Wrench and Monkey Wrench 2, and the KISS word processor. They also created the MAE Assembler software development system, which was available for Commodore PET, Apple II, Atari 8-bit, and other computers. This interview took place on October 17, 2016. Carl, did did you found um, Eastern House yourself, or was it a joint effort? It was a uh, pretty much a joint effort. Jr. and I uh, got into it okay. into the early Commodore days, and uh, then the Atari 800, 400, and 800 came out. And okay. Jr. really got into the Atari end of it. All right, good. Well, um, well, actually, see, Carl, you know, back in the you know middle seventies. Uh, Carl developed his own computer system based on the 6502 Mm -hmm. and uh, built it up from scratch. So he had that. And then around the same time is when at AT AT&T, we were, we had a computer club. And uh, uh, so all of this sort of generated interest on computers and, and things like that. And, uh, uh, and since Carl was interested in the 6502, then the first, you know, Commodore PET came out and it was based on the 6502. Right. So that's where Carl and I sort of, our interests overlapped and that's when we started working together uh, with 6502 stuff. Oh, good. All right, so I'd like to start with, like, the, the prehistory. We'll just pick one of you, and I want to hear about the this early computer that you made, Carl, and about AT&T, JR. And just, so let's, uh, I'll just start with, with Carl, and if you could tell me, like, the, the prehistory up to when you met JR and, and started the company, so I could kind of have some background, please. Oh, okay. Uh, J.R. and I worked together at uh, Western Electric AT&T back in the early 70s. And one summer, I went to uh, NC State uh, working on my uh, master's in double E. And uh, one of the courses I took was on the uh, 8080 microprocessor. That really really got me excited. I was wanting to have my own computer after taking that course. Then one day I was reading um, in Electronics Magazine. There was an ad for uh, for Moss Technology for uh, for twenty five dollars. You could buy a microprocessor. Back in those days, uh, an eighty eighty microprocessor cost about uh, five hundred dollars, and for twenty five dollars I could have an eight bit processor. So shoot, so I sent them twenty five dollars and mm-hmm. and then an extra five dollars for the Tim chip. So for I got two chips. Uh, for thirty dollars, the microprocessor, sixty five oh two microprocessor in the TIM chip with a teletypewriter interface module and the books, programming manual and hardware manual. And uh, so I built my computer uh, and got it to working uh, by uh, just punching in codes on a little keyboard. And uh, then the, eventually one thing led to another, JR and I got started working on the pets and the Ataris. Nice. All right, Jr. What about you? Tell me your prehistory, please. Uh, well, like Carl said, we we worked together and uh, and through the computer club, and you know we we had similar interest in sixty five hundred two, and he he helped uh, generate my interest in the hardware ac- aspects of it, and at the time. I didn't think I'd be that interested in the, the software, but uh, by working with him, he, he helped me with uh, 
learning the 6502 uh, opcodes and, and things like that. And so uh, I started working more and more on that. And then when the Commodore PET computer came out, uh, I was one of the first people to buy one of those. And, uh, you know, I got more interested in to, it came with basic uh, and so yeah, I got when you, more in you, the program when, when you got, through there. Yeah, when you got that 2001 PET computer, when it was the very day that you got it at your house, uh, I remember running over to your house, take a look at that thing. That was that was pretty exciting. Never seen yeah. one before. Yeah, it was it was all exciting at that time. So, at what point did you? guys decide that you were going to create your own products and start a company? Well, what happened was, as part of Carl's uh, work on his homemade computer, uh, he had uh, written an assembler and text editor uh, for the 6502, and then that way you could do assembly language programming and then having at, at using the editor and then uh, and then assemble the code in, in into machine code and put it in the computer to to uh, use. So uh, you know, his uh, I believe it was called assembler text editor. And so uh, we decided to try to convert what he had done for his system into the uh, Commodore PET computer. Mm -hmm. And through working together, we were mm -hmm. able to uh, port it over and, and, and into the uh, Commodore PET. Hey, Kevin, I remember uh, in those early days before he started the company that uh, we had the idea we're going to sell the assembler editor say, for about fifty dollars a copy, mm -hmm. and we had hired Jr.'s wife to type in, type up the manual for us. And I remember, I remember uh, Jr. your wife in disbelief looking at us, saying, "You gonna get fifty dollars for this?" Yeah. <laughs> and this was the product that would be M A E. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, So MAA was eventually available for the the Commodore machines and for the Apple II and for the Atari 400, 800. So that system really made the rounds. Yeah, it also included. It also was. Uh, there's versions for the uh, the Sinertec Sim One. Uh, we put that in in a uh, a ROM, and they uh, they sold it with their development system. Uh, Sinertec did. And then we had a copy for uh, the AIM-65, that Rockwell microprocessor. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was um, a cross-assembler we made into it, uh, a 6800 cross-assembler, uh, by modifying the upcode tables. And we sold it. And then we also did an 8080 cross-assembler, too. So we had a lot of variants of it. Wow. So was JR's wife wrong and people did spend $50 for this thing? And we hired uh, her yes. to run the, run the business. <laughs> wow. Well, well, you know, once we had this thing together, you know, we decided to try to sell it because there would be people out there who would want to use it. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing some small advertisements, you know, in the computer magazines and everything. And next thing you know, the orders come rolling in nice now, so did it sell what, what does that mean does it sell did it sell dozens hundreds or thousands oh what the mae uh it probably sold probably a total of maybe maybe about two thousand mm -hmm. copies uh it was pretty easy to uh, sell software in, in the early days because it was pretty much an infancy in the magazines the um the advertising rates in magazines were uh uh, something like just a, maybe a hundred to three hundred dollars for a half-page ad, 
in like Compute Magazine mm-hmm. and some of the other ones. But uh, later on, it, the uh, the advertising rates quickly ratcheted up to several thousand dollars a page. So, uh, so early in the early days, uh, someone could jump in uh, with a product and, and market it uh, fairly easy. Mm-hmm. What was there? Which platform did it sell best on, or was it pretty even? Um, I think the May sold best on the Commodore end, but JR had a hot product called the Monkey Wrench. He developed that entirely himself. Mm-hmm. And the Machine Language Monitor, wasn't that? Uh, you didn't do that, JR? Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, so at JR, at what point did the Atari enter the picture for you? Because so far we've only talked about the single board computers and Commodores and things. Well, when uh, whatever year it was, uh, when Atari came out with the computer, seventy mm-hmm. nine, uh, and since since it was uh, uh, you know sixty five oh two based, then of course I I went ahead and bought one of those uh, along with all of the accessories and uh, and then we we. <laughs> Ported the, the the May software over and to that, and uh, then we had another platform to to sell the May. And um, I don't uh, seems like we had some communications with some of the people at at uh, Atari. Uh, do you remember Carl? Yeah, because we had to go and figure out how to interface to the uh, the, the embedded ROM system on the uh, yeah the yeah party. we got uh, we yeah we got some of the the uh, the uh, hardware information of how it was put together and and uh, some of the uh, the uh, memory locations were some of the input output locations were and. Things like that, and uh, anyway, about that same time, there was a product for the Commodore called the uh, Toolbox. Remember that, Carl? Oh, uh, yeah, I think I do. That you knocking these old cobwebs okay. out of the brain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was. It's called a Toolbox, and I, I don't remember the guy's name. I think you communicated with him. Uh, from time to time, but uh, first, name, first name was Bill, wasn't it? I, you know, I don't, I just don't remember. That was decades ago. But uh, anyway, there was a product called a toolbox, and and it ba- basically added, you know, a software that added uh, some uh, additional basic commands. To the system, and I thought that was pretty neat. And I thought, well, you know, we need something like that for the, the Atari. Uh, so that's how I got the idea to come up with some software to more or less like a toolbox that would give some additional uh, commands that would ex- make it easier to use. Uh, the Atari system, and uh, at, at that time, I don't remember which came first, but somewhere, you know, the, the Atari 800 had the A and B slot, and uh, when you put BASIC in it, uh, you know, the B slot was open. Mm-hmm. So I, I sat down and researched and understood how the, the hardware, how the hardware for that B slot was supposed to work, and also you know some of the software uh, points that I needed to know about. And anyway, I sat down and. Started uh, 
doing some software, uh, the first piece was the renumber command. Uh, and it took a while to put that together, but I finally got it all together and, and some other commands to sort of make up. And uh, uh, then, I, fortunately, I had some experience making my own circuit boards. So I laid out and designed a a circuit board that would fit in that fit in V slot. And uh, and and we. With Carl's help, uh, I set it up for, what was it, Carl, 2016 ROMs, yeah. EPROMs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, EPROMs, yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, between the hardware and the software, finally got it to work. And, uh, uh, you know, it seemed, seemed to work pretty good. Uh, uh, that was the one that uh, I originally called the Monkey Ranch. And uh, uh, Carl found a, some guys that were selling uh, or that we could buy some cases from. And uh, we started having the circuit boards made and the, the cases. And we started making all of the hardware for the the monkey wrench and it uh, seemed to work pretty good initially yeah back in those days uh we had put on different kinds of hats we had to do uh, advertising copy advertising the uh with the magazines we had to write the software had to reverse engineer the roms on the atari and the, and the uh pets then write software lay out the circuit board. We did a lot of soldering of components, burning EPROMs, and uh, packaging up, mailing, shipping, bulk shipping catalogs. It was uh, it was quite a different different world back in those days. Mm-hmm. And sweeping the floor. Sweep, <laughs> yeah, sweeping the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so where, uh, where were you guys based at the time? In Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Well, see, we all of this started, there. all of this started in our all of this started in our basements. And yeah, then yeah, once the business grew, then we went into an office building. Okay. And who oh. and who was there? It was the two of you, and then there was another gentleman doing Apple stuff. Um, and then there was Jared's wife running the office. Was, was that it, the four of you, or were there others? And we have one more person working with us, uh, Beth. Sort her name. Uh, she worked with us, and then we had subcontractors who would uh, who would do the soldering for us. Mm. Uh, at, at, we did Jr. and I did soldering uh, these boards to the point where we just didn't have enough time to get it all done. So mm-hmm. we contracted that out to uh, some uh, assembly folks who used to work at uh, Western Electric Factory, you know, mm-hmm. and then we'd put it all together. But Jr. and I. JR and I ended up having to do the testing of all these circuit boards, finding where uh, the main components not inserted properly or they have solder bridges, and, and then doing the final assembly. Hmm. Because you needed uh, an actual actual Atari in front of you to, to run the tests, I assume. And we had a test jig also. No. Yeah, we had, yeah, we had a test jig to hmm. where once, once you put the EPROM in there and you could run a, a test on it to make sure that all of the, the software codes were in there properly and if there was any kind of uh, solder issues it would show up during this test. Hmm. All right. In those early days that uh, we were getting uh, lots of phone calls from uh, people wanting to purchase products and it, uh, the the uh, the girls dealt with the phones during the, the day, and uh, but uh, it was uh, and there's no lo- it was no toll free numbers either. People people wanted the products 
in those early days so badly that they're willing to make long distance phone calls and place orders. Wow. So the guy who did Apple stuff was named Don Earnhardt. Earnhardt. All right. Yeah, he did the uh, he did the Apple uh, 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 products for us, primarily the uh, the uh, the May port to the Apple II. Hmm. Good. All right. So Monkey Wrench came out, and I understand based on what I've read, I don't have a copy of Monkey Wrench One. It was that uh, it wasn't actually in a case. It was just a, a circuit board that you shoved into the into the B slot. Is that right? Ah, you're testing my memory too. Uh, <laughs> it uh, it may have been, but uh, only for a short period. Okay. But yeah, I mean, pretty much. Uh, uh, Kevin, do you actually you have, have a monkey? Which one? No, I have. Uh, I have a two. I don't have a one. Yeah, well, actually, you know, the the first uh, series of this was just called a monkey branch. Right. So why did it's you... When, yeah, why did you... Uh, what was the difference between one and two? Why did you come up with two? How well did each sell? Tell me the differences. Well, the... the uh, there was a lot of requests for additional commands and stuff like that. And I don't remember what was added between the first monkey wrench and monkey wrench two, but monkey wrench two added additional commands that weren't available initially. And, but but then monkey wrench two became the staple and, uh, that uh, that we used. Mm-hmm. How well did and, uh, they sell? We sold a bunch of them. I don't remember. I have no idea. Sure. How many? Uh, at we one, sold at one time, yeah, you know, at one time we was advertising in uh, uh, thirteen different. Uh, early computer magazines. Wow! So uh, we had a we got a wide uh, wide reach. Yeah, I know we we were buying the, uh, plastic cases from California. We had a uh, it got to the point where we bought the actual mold the injection mold for the uh, the little plastic case that goes around the uh, monkey wrench. Uh, and we also that same case would also work with the uh, Commodore. So we were bringing them in several thousand in each shipment from California, uh, but we never did keep any actual number counts. We were really pretty much a uh, sort of a fly by night type business. It's not really a weren't a whole there wasn't a whole lot of bean counting going on in the early days. We was just producing stuff as fast as we could in order to uh, fill orders. Sure. Nice. And you're getting calls from all over the United States, people uh, uh, placing orders. Were you getting technical support calls and things like that, too? Or? Yeah, we're, oh, getting, yes. we're getting, yeah, we're getting, te- well, we're also getting uh, calls from other countries, too. Uh, people think long distance calls from uh, 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 Holland, uh, uh, England, uh, mainly the, uh, the uh, people who speak English, because that's we didn't speak any other language but in English. The, uh, uh, we got quite a few. We got quite a few calls from Japan and um, the uh, for the products. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, you know, sometimes you know we get technical calls about uh, some kind of uh, issue or problem people were having. And, you know, we could look into it and decide whether there was a, a bug in the software or, or not. And if there was a bug, I would uh, I would update the software and, and send the person uh, a brand new uh, copy of it. Nice. Yeah, the, for- the fortunate thing about... Uh about us both jr and i both had technical writing experience and uh jr especially 
got to be a really good uh, 6502 programmer. He knew he knew the uh, hex code for each of the opcodes by heart. Mm-hmm. So uh, we had to uh, we had to uh, uh, write the manuals as we was doing the software at the same time. Wow. So you also had a product for the Atari called KISS, which I believe was a word processor that worked within BASIC? Yes. Yeah. Tell me about this product, because it seems like a strange idea. Uh, it was basically a, a type of word processor to that you could use the same editor in, uh, that you had that came with the uh, Atari and uh, you could put in uh, uh, different codes uh, to tell the software what you wanted to do. Now, of course, you know, all of this was before uh you know you had uh, uh all of the nice software that you have that that came along a little bit later mm-hmm. uh uh you know in word processing where you you know what you see is what you get uh so this was just a way of putting in different commands as you write your software or write your 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 uh, words and sentences to show where uh, paragraphs start and and line breaks and other things uh, Mm -hmm. that would help make your writing a little easier. Did that? How did that sell? Uh, that wasn't one of our bigger sellers. <laughs> we had a few flops. Yeah. Tell me. What worked and what didn't. Remember the, you remember the, uh, the graphics drawing compiler and the music compiler? Uh, yeah. Remember, remember those JR? Well, you had another product that sold pretty good, though, was the machine language monitor for the, uh, for the Atari. I don't think I know about that one. A little cartridge. Um, refresh my memory, Carl. It was, uh, what I'm doing is I, I've got one of the old uh, catalogs here, and it's got uh, machine language monitor for the uh, monkey wrench. It's a separate item from the I mean, the machine language monitor for the Atari, which is a separate item from the uh, monkey wrench. Uh, what I remember, it was just an extension of, uh, it was a monitor for doing uh, uh, opcode entry. Um, the, let me think here. What that thing it had, it did have a disassembler in it and uh, a mini assembler. Is that what the machine language yeah. launcher had? Yeah, and I thought there was a disassembler in there. Yeah. Boy, that's been so long ago. I just don't remember mm-hmm. all of it. Let's see. And I found, uh, so you guys had MAE. You, apparently you sold a EEPROM cartridge just as a something, you, I guess, people could program themselves. Uh, you're the one with the catalog in front of you there, uh, Carl, you probably have a better list. I would... Hey, we have one more item, which is uh, kind of obscure, I guess. is uh, It's called Trap 65. Have you heard of it? Yeah, so this was a, a gadget that sat between the, the, the processor and the computer to trap illegal opcodes. Is that right? Yeah, you pull your 6502 microprocessor chip out of the socket and plug this little board in then put your 6502 on the top of the uh, board. And what it would do is that anytime you utilized a uh, illegal opcode, 
uh, with software provided, it would uh, do a, uh, what do you call it, software interrupt. And at that vector, you could go in and write uh, customized uh, commands for opcodes. Hmm. Like you could have, uh, you can say like, you could have, you could create a uh, machine language opcode that just to zero out all the registers you wanted to. Or you could have just uh, an opcode, just a hex code that will uh, do something even like, like 16-bit arithmetic. Uh, it, uh, it allowed you to extend the, uh, the instruction set. Because there's a lot of uh, illegal opcodes in the 6502 space. Mm-hmm. Right. Cool. But I think, but I think uh, later revisions, later on, after the uh, the uh, after the peak period of the Commodore and peak period of the Atari, and uh, I think some of the uh, manufacturers actually modified the 6502 chip itself and implemented uh, a vectoring. So that illegal op code would actually uh, uh, would actually go and uh, be zero. They zeroed out those op codes, I just see. So they would actually uh, do some of the functions of Trap sixty five. Hmm. Hmm. Nice. Could I? Um, I can't find a scan of that catalog online, Carl. Could, is it possible you could scan that or lend it to me so that I can scan it? Yeah, I could. Uh, yeah, I could, I could send them to you if, or uh, scan them either one. Great. Yeah, I've got a lot of uh, the old uh, product literature and stuff with some of the other stuff. I could probably box all that up and send it to you too. Oh, neat. Yeah, I'd love that. We could uh, scan that and get it online for the uh, the retro computing. People, okay. see, I found a product called in my research uh, one called Vic Rabbit for for the Vic Twenty, which basically sounds like Monkey Wrench for the Vic Twenty. Well, that was uh, something Jay and I worked closely together on that one. That was uh, back in the early days. That was before hard drives and actually before floppy drives, when people were using the uh, data cassettes, little little cassette tapes mm-hmm. for data storage. Yeah. The uh, on the uh, the pets and the and the Vix uh, and also on early Ataris, uh, you use cassette tape if you want to save your data. Uh, but they were real slow, so we developed a uh, technique where we could uh, dramatically speed up the uh, read and write time to cassette tape using the uh, the Vic Rabbit and the uh, Commodore 64 Rabbit. Cool. So overall, of the the whole company, the whole picture, what was the 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 biggest sellers? My guests are MAE and Monkey Wrench too. And the rabbit, yes. and the Vic Rabbit and Sixty Four Rabbit. Mm. Cool. We had other little products like uh, we had like Telstar Sixty Four. We had the graphics compiler, the music compiler, machine language monitors. Uh, Word processor, at Kiss Word processor, and uh, um, we sold um, cartridges and EEPROM programmer. Um, and uh, a terminal device. I don't even anything, I don't remember this. Anything one. anybody wanted to buy. <laughs> <laughs> so what well, were at, these? One time, at one time, we sold Commodore computers. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. But we give that up. That was too much trouble. <laughs> we we went back to software. <laughs> yeah. So what were this this uh, music compiler and graphics compiler you mentioned? I I have not heard of those. Can't find any information online. I've seen a Jr. You did the music compiler. And I did the graphics compiler. Is that right? Oh boy, I don't I don't remember the details now. If I remember correctly. What we did was is it was a uh, extension to the Mayo Similar, and we provided uh, graphical drawing with with a graphics compiler. We provided graphical drawing commands, uh, instruction sets with the uh, with the Assembler editor, mm-hmm. so you can do uh, graphical functions. And you was doing something with music and the May. Uh, uh, let me see here. What's this? What's this catalog say? 
the Eastern House software PET and Sim Micro similar. Listen, that's not it. Let's see. Music and Sound. Music and Sound Composer. Uh, we recommend 24 kilobytes of RAM memory in order to effectively use this compiler. The, uh, <laughs> This has been so long, I could hardly remember some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I get that a lot. Yeah. So tell me about the. Uh, how long did the company last, and, and when and why did it shut down? I think we we started um, East Now Software, was it 1979? Was it what it was, JR? Yeah, I think so. And 79 to, uh, what was it, 85? Because I remember um, doing the when doing some of the accounting, our peak time, the very peak of the company was in the, uh, was uh, I think it was in the summer of 1983. Uh, we peaked yeah. out. Yeah. And... Uh, Sales started drifting off because the IBM PC was starting to start really take off. That uh, IBM was what killed us the, uh, with the with their PC, and uh, then sales started dropping off. Then advertising rates dramatically started shooting up from just a few hundred dollars for a page up to thousand dollars, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand for a page of advertising, and uh, we started having to cut back on advertising after that point and. Because uh, at one point, uh, the cost to advertising advertise was about it's about half of what the product sold for. So we, we saw the handwriting on the wall and started scaling back. And uh, if it had not been for IBM entering the market with their PC, the, uh, I think the, uh, the Atari and the Commodore and the Apple would have uh, would been uh, something that would have lasted much, much longer for us. What do you uh, both do today, Jr.? I'm retired. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? How do you spend I, your time? Uh, how do I spend my time? Yeah. Any way I want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I retired from AT&T in 97 and uh, did some contract work until about 2002 or three, and uh, then I went into uh, the construction business. I was a general contractor and, and built residential housing for uh, a number of years, and then when the economy went bad uh, back in uh, 2008, nine. 10 time frame uh, 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 thing. I just decided to fully retire and uh, mm-hmm. take life a little easier. Nice. What about you, Carl? What do you do today? Uh, I'm retired too. Mm-hmm. Uh, after Eastern Health Software, I continued in some, doing some programming with uh, with the uh, in C language and C and into .NET in Java. I did a little Android phone pro, uh, programming, but uh, I'm retired. I'm, I'm giving up my software handle. <laughs> All right. We're getting old. Our brains don't work as good as when we when was young. Yeah, I get it. Back in the Yeah, we were in our early 30s back then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah JR and I would work... Uh, was was working at AT and T a regular day, then we'd probably work uh, till like two or three o'clock in the morning and wow. get up go to work the next morning. So we it, it took a lot out of us. Yeah, I did. yeah, it was hard. But I mean, when at its peak, it it sounds like it was uh, definitely a profitable business more than a hobby, right? Yeah, it was very profitable. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We had a um, we rented an office uh, in Winston Salem, and uh, we had uh, there's two girls that uh, answered the phones and did, 
and print did the uh, prepping of the uh, shipping. And of course, of course, Jr. and I, Jr. and I would uh, a lot of times would deliver finished products for them to uh, box up and ship out, taking the orders and uh, um, and dealing with the uh, uh, the uh, routine routine times of the business was running. Mm-hmm. It was probably one of the most fun and interesting times in computing there ever was. Yeah, yeah I would agree. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we were interested in the computers and the hardware and the software, and then all of a sudden we had to learn how to do business stuff. So. <laughs> So and taxes and and how to handle this and that. So you know it was you know wide open as far as you know it it, it was a good learning experience uh, to to learn about all the ins and outs of business and, mm-hmm. and uh, doing the computer stuff and uh, but one of the other advantages. Uh, it gave us a little extra money to save, and therefore it helped us get interested in the stock market. Hmm. And uh, so that was something else we were learning all at the same time as doing everything else. Nice. And, uh, you know, got at least got me, you know, interested in investing and learning about the stock market and and so, you know, it, it paid off all the way around. Cool. Yeah, one, Kevin, one thing about it, too, is that we were on the East Coast in North Carolina. Yeah. And all the action was in the West Coast or in Massachusetts. Uh, well, Massachusetts was many computers back in those days. And the West Coast was where people like us were doing stuff with, with microprocessors. And the uh, we didn't have uh, access to uh, business skilled folks and uh, what kind of investment capital type people uh, were naive at the, back in those days. And uh, I think if we were on the West Coast, we might have we, we might have lasted quite a bit longer mm. with uh, getting some people who knew how to run a business. Yeah. Did you guys go to any trade shows or anything, a CES or any of that kind of stuff? Mm, not to, uh, not to uh, promote our products, mm. no. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I mean, I'm looking for stories. I did, could, any stories we haven't touched on yet about Eastern House, people you met, or uh, problems you you uh, encountered? You remember the uh, magazine uh, Compute? Sure, of course. Oh, I see. What was his name? Robert? Um, Locke. We, Robert Locke, yeah. Uh, we worked with him in the early days. He started off like we did, too, working out of his house and. uh and uh, we were uh, we we got in touch with him early on, and we were in his uh, first issue of his magazine, and uh, we spent a lot of time over in Greensboro where he was stationed. Uh, there just wasn't many people in our local area that were doing the same thing we was doing. Mm, yeah, yeah. I noticed you had Carl. You had a, an article in the first issue of Compute called uh, "Universal 6502 Memory Test." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still have a copy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Oh my goodness. Those were uh, those were something else. Well, you know, in Greensboro, we they had one of the first bite shops back in even before we got into it. Uh, you could t- remember Bite Magazine? Sure, of course. Uh, it it was big. It was the premier magazine, but it faded because I guess it. The the, the the microcomputer industry was was fast changing and going in different directions. Byte lost its way, compute eventually lost its way and got sold out. And then I think analog compute analog computing was that analog was for Atari, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But even before all those magazines, there was a Carolina computer hobbyist. That's supposed to supposedly that was one of the was the first hobbyist computer magazine. Hmm. It predated Byte. Uh, I used to have a. Well, there were a number of uh, of uh, low 
local uh, clubs that had uh, uh, newsletters and things like that that uh, that uh, we interacted with uh, from time to time. Uh, uh, they would they would happily send us copies of their stuff and and uh, so there was the, you know. It, it was the hobby days and, and there was all all kinds of people doing who were interested in computers and and uh doing their own thing and uh, a lot of them were out west right and, yeah there was there was a lot of but, uh hobbyist programmers like us who were selling products in that uh, in the after hours they would call one another and uh picking brains and looking for ideas for the next hot product I never will forget the guy who wrote Frogger. I think John was, Harris. Yeah. If I remember correctly, he was, uh, back in that time frame, he was like in his, like 20 years old, and he had struck rich with that game. And uh, I remember talking to him one night uh, on the phone, and uh, he told me he bought a new house didn't have any furniture in it. All he wants to do is <laughs> try to come up with the next Frogger game. <laughs> 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 and then there's some of the principals from uh, Apple and uh, Commodore. A lot of times we'd have nighttime conversations with them. Uh, we're just trying to think of ideas. And uh, <laughs> one thing I do remember is that one of those guys from Commodore, uh, Bill, I can't think of his last name, but he said that Back in the early 80s, uh, Commodore's working on this product called a notebook computer. At the time, I thought that was so far-fetched, it's unbelievable, a notebook computer. <laughs> <laughs> but today, I mean, it's not far-fetched. <laughs> no, not at all. There was, uh, no. there was one other thing we got into, too. was in Radio Electronics Magazine. They had a... Uh, uh, a little article on how to build a, your own little terminal, CRT terminal, using a television set. Uh-huh. You get a yeah. black and white television, and you uh, you had these PC board circuit tracers in the magazine. You take those out and have them photographically reduced. You etch your own circuit board, and you buy the chips and build it up. And then uh, you can hook it up to a television with a keyboard, and you made yourself into you made yourself a CRT. I built one of those, and then I modified the hardware in it so that it would go from uh, being instead of being 32 characters by 16, it would be uh, 64 characters wide, hmm. and then uh, 32 characters down. Wow. Uh, 24 characters down. 24 characters down. And, uh, so so wow. in the early days, we had to do a lot of lot of things that uh, with days computing it just built in. Yeah. We had uh, we had paper tape readers, teletype machines, uh, the uh, some of the things that people don't even some of people don't have never seen in their life. <laughs> Did you guys ever have any interactions with uh, with Atari directly? Did you talk to anybody directly, uh, Jr. It's been so long. I don't remember. I, I, I remember. You know, we got some documentation and things like that from mm-hmm. somebody at Atari, but uh, I, I don't remember the details. But I mean, I, I do have some. Some. Uh, I think I have some of the original code. Uh, that somebody sent us, hmm. uh, of, uh, and of course all of the uh, you know important memory locations of <laughs> where things were stored and and uh, where you had access to different types of subroutines. Sure. Which gets to my next question, which is: Do you guys still have uh, Carl? You mentioned you still have a catalog. Do you still have any of the source code, any of the software? Um, of course, none of your source code is available, and some, like Monkey Wrench, has been 
ROM dumped, but no one seems to have a copy of Monkey Wrench 1 or Kiss. Or, uh, so what, what do you guys have? Well, I, I have a box full of Eastern House software stuff that I put back years ago. Well, but I'm not 100% sure where it's at hmm. uh, right now. The I've moved a couple of times over the years, so mm-hmm. it's here somewhere. I just hadn't found it. But, uh, I mean, I still, I, I've got boxes full of, uh, of uh, floppy disks with software up there. Wow. And I have, I have a number of the old Atari games. Mm-hmm. And, and things like that. So, uh, I mean, I have bits and pieces. I still have the original prototype for the uh, that I used for the B slot uh, on the Atari. So, wow, well, that was uh, that I mean, was in the days even before three and a half inch floppy. It was all on five and a quarter inch floppies. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I've got uh, an Atari set up right here on my desk with the five and a quarter inch floppy, and uh, I have a system where I can move data from those to a modern computer. So, if when you find that stuff, Jr., I would love to borrow it. I can transfer it and save it before uh, before that media rots away. Yeah, I've I've got a whole photo album full of uh, Eastern House stuff that. Uh, wow. Well. That I collected, but uh, I know it's here somewhere. I just hadn't hadn't come across it lately. Okay. Well, when you find it, please let me know. I'd love to borrow it. Okay, send me some email. Cool. All right. So, um, for the community of Atari users out mm-hmm. there who are still out there, I would like to know if you uh, if you guys could send them a message, and you can right now. What would you tell them? Carl, do you want to go first? Uh, to the community of Atari enthusiasts. Mm-hmm. Anyway, ghosts from the past. Uh, I, I'm sort of impressed that uh, you still find enjoyment working with uh, antique computers. Uh, my hobby today is uh, antique radios and antique televisions. I rebuild uh, vacuum tube radios and vacuum tube uh, black and white televisions. So uh, I'm into antique electronics and you're into antique computers. That's good. Nice. Jr. Uh, well, the only, the only thing I think to say is, you know, originally I never thought I would be that involved in computers or in, and especially software in the early days, but uh, uh, things happen and, you know, you find out you know, that some of this stuff you didn't think you could be interested in, you are interested in. And, you know, it can change your life. And, uh, you know, just computers in general, they're they're still interesting to me today, but uh, I I don't use a a lot of it anymore. But uh, it's, it's still exciting to see what people are coming out with. One more, uh, one more parting thought. Mm-hmm. When I was in college, people did not did not know what software was. I would distinctly remember uh, in my junior year in college, before I had any programming class, software to me was t-shirts and underwear. Uh, that's what it meant. <laughs> Today, so- everybody knows what software is. Little kids know what software is. So the, this is a whole different world today than it was back when we were. In our our, uh, our teens and early twenties. Yes, indeed. I think I uh, I have what I need. Thank you both so much for the, your time today. Oh, appreciate calling, Kevin. Yeah, it was nice talking to you and hearing about some of the old stuff again. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library 
with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.